Jeremiah chapter 10. I want to read verses 1 and 2, then we'll get into this message, the Bible and gambling. Now, this series is designed to touch on some of the major issues that occur in our culture and in society at large. And you will understand, since I'm trying to do only one message on each topic, I'm pretty limited as to how much I can uh, give you. So, um, of course, if you were to do like we did in Russia and bring your meal with you and we sat here six hours while I preached, then I, I would be willing to do that. But I don't know if you would. <laughs> it's always amazing, okay? Um, one of my black preacher friends said years ago, he said, remember, brother guy, that a brain can only absorb as much as the seat can endure. So if your seat can't endure uh, six hours, your brain probably is not going to be able to absorb that, right? <laughs> All right, by now you should have had Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. For the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of his hands, the workman with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. They are upright in the palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil. Neither also is in it uh, is is it in them to do good. Talking here about idolatry and uh, the way of the heathen, uh, the. Uh, uh, Preoccupation with the occult. This is his message to the people of Israel who had be, become pressed into the mold of the society in which they live. Uh, your distinction from your society as a believer in Christ, your distinction is the major part of your testimony. Proverbs 3 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Philippians 4 19, Paul is in prison. And he writes a joyous note and a thank you note to the people at Philippi. And he tells them, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. <coughs> and uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 17 says, Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord, 2 Corinthians 6, 17 and 18. Years ago, uh, I stopped and buy gas like everybody else does, and I stopped at one of our local places to buy gas, and uh, went in there, and one of our church members was there buying scratch-offs and lottery tickets. And uh, she saw me and uh, looked immediately guilty, and uh, was quick to say this, well, I know, Pastor, you don't approve of this, but I see nothing wrong with it. It's my way of relaxing. And I don't know how that's relaxing. But, but she was a non-thinking Christian. We have a lot of those, right? So I responded to her, look, you're not a member of the church staff, and so I have no reason to confront you on this. You know, if you were a member of my church staff, uh, you'd be in my office tomorrow morning. We'd be dealing with this. So I turned to the register to pay for my gas and walk out, but she wouldn't leave the issue alone. She followed me and she said, well, just tell me what is wrong with a Christian playing lotto. One thing that I noticed is she never used the word gambling. I said, well, since you ask, let me give you a few things to think about. First of all, would Jesus buy scratch-offs or lotto tickets? <clears throat> Secondly, the Bible says we're not to learn the way of the heathen. Thirdly, how is gambling obeying this command? Come out from among them and be you separate. And fourth, how does gambling support trusting God to meet our needs? Can you answer me those questions? Well, of course, she huffed and muttered something and turned and she walked out of the store and also out of the church. I never saw her again after that. Don't even have any idea what happened to her. Well, the Bible does not say thou shalt not gamble. Doesn't say that at all. But it does give you a host of principles which can apply to gambling and clearly reveal what it is. So some of the excuses that I've heard people use for approving gambling are interesting. I, I collect excuses. 
<laughs> and I collect them from my students at the college where I teach. And I tell them, look, I've been teaching at the university level for about 58 years, so you probably can't come up with an excuse I haven't heard. So don't give me an excuse about why you didn't get your assignment done. One of the students told me the other day, he said, I've got one you haven't heard. <laughs> and he told me what it was. And uh, I said, you know, I haven't heard that one. You know, so that's the first time. But here's what some people use as excuses for justifying buying scratch-offs and buying lotto tickets. Uh, there's no harm in it. I'm not hurting anyone. Here's another one. Well, it's my money. I can do with it as I please. Here's another one. Well, a lot of my friends play lotto and they're good people. Here's another excuse. I pay my bills, I give to my church, and besides, I need something to do that I enjoy doing. I work hard all week. And then this is my favorite here. Well, preacher, if I win big, I'm giving 10% to the church. <laughs> and in almost every case, they aren't giving 10% now. <laughs> so the likelihood they're going to give 10% of a million, I don't think so. <laughs> so I could go on with many ridiculous excuses I've heard, and I've got a file full of them, you know. We've all probably heard stories of how gambling has destroyed families, how it's wrecked the lives of the gamblers, and how it's even led to broken relationships that didn't have to be broken. But gambling is sinful not because all of those things have occurred, it's sinful because it violates clear principles in the Word of God. Principles which are taught uh, to us in the Word of God. Have you ever notice that those who are seeking casino licenses usually tie gambling to something good? You ever notice that? Well, we want to have this license because it will produce revenues for our schools. Well, I've gone and actually examined how much revenue has increased from casinos and found out that so far it's in the level of zero, you know? Well, it will bring in enough income to reduce property taxes. So raise your hand if your property taxes have gone down. That's what I thought, okay. Uh, also, it will provide funds for community improvement. I haven't seen that one either. Remember, you will usually find error camouflaging itself as truth, but you will seldom find truth never find truth. In fact, camouflaging itself is error. It just doesn't happen. Researchers have told us that where casinos are allowed, the crime rate goes up. Some have even affirmed that where casinos are allowed, the divorce rate goes up. So why don't we look at some principles that you would have to violate if you decided to use your money to gamble. Principle number one, Tell the truth. The promise of community improvement is a lie. The promise of increasing the revenue to schools is a lie. The promise of making the community better is a lie. Exodus 20.16 says, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. So somebody comes in and wants a, a, a casino license, he has to lie to all the people that are going to be his neighbors. You know? Uh, Proverbs 8, 7, my mouth shall speak truth and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. I don't think I've met any casino people looking for licenses that fit that category. <laughs> Jeremiah 9, 5, and they will deceive everyone his neighbor and will not speak the truth. Ephesians 4, 25, Paul says, wherefore putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. Tom Stiles has written a little pamphlet, and I use some of his information. It's called The Truth About Gambling. And in there, here's what he says, and I'm quoting, Legal gambling operations are steeped in deceit. Lottery officials conceal or misstate the odds. To hide the passage of time, casinos, you may have noticed, do not have clocks or windows. Slot machines that tease players into believing they will win the big one, are programmed to favor the casino, end of quote. The casino officials lie about their purpose. They lie about the promised benefits. They lie about the results of having the casinos. And they lie about the odds. So if you buy scratch-offs or lotto tickets, you are a victim of the same lying mentality. See, gambling is a well-organized and an attractively presented form of deception. 
Principle number two, be industrious. Many people who gamble are really in pursuit of the get-rich-quick scheme. Motivated by greed, they seek a big payoff. And they say, if this big payoff comes, I'll finally be able to enjoy life because all I've had to do most of my life is work. So after the fall, God told Adam and Eve in Genesis 3.19, of the sweat of thy faith shalt thou eat bread. In other words, you should work if you want to eat. Paul later emphasizes this in his letters to the Thessalonian Christians. He said, if you've got people in the church who are given the opportunity to work and they won't do it, don't feed them. There's something about having food in your belly that motivates you, right? <laughs> That's what he's saying. Well, the New Testament church taught that, 2 Thessalonians 3.10. <clears throat> Jesus himself worked. He worked in his father's uh, shop, Joseph's shop, uh, carpentry shop. Paul worked making tents so he could stay in the ministry. I can't tell you the number of preachers I've come across who left the ministry because they said, I didn't make, make enough money to live on. And, they, and I would say, well, did God call you? Well, yeah, well, then how could you leave? Mm -hmm. I don't understand how you can leave, you know? And I said, why don't you get a job? Well, God called me, and he's supposed to take care of me. Sometimes he uses these to take care of you, you know? Amen. Get out and get a job. So work is honorable. It's an honorable involvement. And anyone who has worked knows this, too. Honest work brings satisfaction and it improves your self-image. Now, for many people, gambling is an attempt to get around working, to hit it big, to lounge on the beaches of the world. And like Satan, gambling must promise more than it can deliver in order to attract as many unsuspecting fools as possible. Gambling depends upon false appearances in order to attract the gullible patrons to which it appeals. I heard a story out of the Orient years ago. I don't know what is actually true. It's probably been passed down, but it illustrates the point of being deceived by what appears to be real. A Japanese man, elderly, fatherly-looking man, was sitting on the curb. It had rained the previous night, and puddles had gathered in the road. He was sitting on the curb, and he had a fishing pole, and his line was in a puddle on the road. A passerby asked him, said, Sir, what in the world are you doing? The old man smiled and looked at him and said, Fishing. What? The passerby asked. Fishing in a one-inch puddle? Yes, the old man said as he nodded. Well, the passerby felt... The guy was either crazy or he maybe needed something to drink or eat. So he said, come with me and I'll buy you something to drink and eat. So the old man pulled his line out of the puddle, wrapped it up, took his pole and followed the man into the restaurant. The passerby looked at the man as the man ate and drank what he was given. And he was still curious and feeling sorry for the older man. He asked the old Japanese man, he said, how many did you catch today? The old gentleman sipped his drink, smiled at the other man and said, you're the third. <laughs> Appearances can be deceiving. Casinos look beautiful. They have fancy restaurants associated with them. They have elaborate places for you to stay so that you can spend your money a week or two weeks at a time if you would like. Gambling depends on deception. Principles violated by gambling, telling the truth, number two, being industrious, number three, investing wisely. Jesus talked more about managing your money in the Gospels than he did about heaven and hell. Isn't that amazing? He saw the need of wisely managing resources. And money, riches, wealth, basically they lack value themselves. If I reach in my wallet and I pull out this piece of paper that's been printed by the United States government, it actually has absolutely no value except in terms of what I can exchange it for. Um, in our society, we have confused the cost of things with the value of things. Many things that cost a lot of money have absolutely no real value. But they satisfy some fleshly 
sensitivity. Value is attributed to money and basically on the open market is what it can be exchanged for, what goods can be purchased by. So let's face it, we can't do very much with that money. We just took an offer. Uh, we have to come up with about $1,000 a week in order to survive. And if we're short of that, we struggle. And in the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, 14, I think you've probably read that, <clears throat> you remember the goodman was about to go on a long journey, so he called his servants together. And according to the passage, he knew what he believed the capacity of each servant was. So he gave one five talents, which is a measure of, of precious metal, probably silver, could have been gold, and uh, those five talents were his, his entrusting something to that particular servant. Then he gave another one two talents, and he gave one servant one talent. And interestingly enough, the emphasis of the passage is not upon how much each was given, but whether or not he responsibly handled what he was given. Faithfulness is the message. So, in the passage, Jesus blessed the five-talent man for getting five talents. <coughs> and then he blessed the two-talent man for giving, getting two more talents. In other words, they had both invested wisely, but then he reprimanded the one man who said, I knew you were austere, I knew that you made great demands, so I didn't want to get in trouble, so I hid the talent you gave me in the ground, here it is. And he reprimanded him and called him a wicked servant because he had violated the principle of proper investment. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. Money spent on gambling is money which cannot be invested. You would not deliberately go to the, market, the stock market and hear your broker say, I wouldn't invest in this, man. This is, this is, you're losing your money if you invest in this. You wouldn't invest in it. And yet you go down and buy a lotto ticket. You go down and buy a scratch off. And the likelihood of your winning anything. A friend of mine used to umpire baseball together. He spent $100 a week on scratch offs and lottery tickets. He could afford it. You know, he had a, had a good job and he umpired baseball because he loved it. I umpired it because I needed the money. And uh, so we'd go together to games. He'd buy these scratch-offs and he'd buy these lotto tickets. And he came in one day and said, man, I won $2,500 the other day on a scratch-off. And I said, oh, that's great. I said, now let's see, $100 a week, $5,200 a year times 10 years, that's 5,200. I said, you know, uh, you actually lost money by winning. Because you spent, you know, fifty thousand dollars to win twenty five hundred, I said somehow that doesn't sound like a good investment to me. You know, well, at the judgment seat of Christ, our lives will be in review, and they'll be in review by someone that you can't deceive. I won't be able to deceive Christ. You won't be able to. Our heavenly rewards will be based upon our earthly performance. We'll be at the judgment seat of Christ because we're saved. People who are not at the judgment seat of Christ will appear at the great white throne judgment, at which point they will be told they're going to spend eternity separated from God in the devil's lake of fire because they had the opportunity and didn't take advantage of it. You and I will not have a second chance to live the life that we now have. So we're either going to choose to honor God with it or choose to dishonor God with the present life. Gambling steals from us resources for which we must one day give account. So if you invest money at 8% interest, it doubles in nine years. A lot of times, well, I remember when I was uh, selling insurance and everything years ago when I was in college, uh, we had what we called the 7-12 rule. You invest money for seven years at 12% interest, it doubles. Well, this is the 9-8 rule. 8% 8 interest over nine years, your money doubles. You see, the key is to have a plan to stick to the plan. And gambling interrupts the plan of investment. It violates these principles. The principle of being honest, the principle of being industrious, the principle of managing your resources wisely. And by the way, the more we make on wise investments, the more we have to give to the Lord's work. That's the way I look at it. Number four principle, respect for others. <clears throat> Under this principle, I want to examine two areas. First of all, love for your neighbor, 
And then number two, not exploiting the weaker brother. First of all, let's look at love for our neighbor. Mark 12, 31, Jesus commanded, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So in order for one to win at gambling, others must lose. As gambling expands, social, economic, and spiritual conditions also explode. And no one who takes from his neighbor through gambling can actually stand before God and say, I really love my neighbor. So that's love for our neighbor. But there's another thing about this respect for others. That's not exploiting the poor. Gambling casinos do not care about the losses of others. All they care about is the winnings of the casino. That's all they care about. That's their income. So if we join in their motive, their plan, we participate in exploitation. National Gambling Impact Study Commission, which was established years ago, said that those with less than $10,000 income, this would have been back in the 70s, those with less than $10,000 income spend the most on lottery tickets. High school dropouts spend four times as much on lottery tickets as college graduates do. So believers in Christ ought not to share in the exploitation of the disadvantaged. Abstain from all appearance of evil. 1 Thessalonians 5.22, Paul reminded us. Let me give you number five as a principle here. Number four was respect for others. Number five, the principle, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Historically, gambling has been associated with a false god. And there's a lot, if you really are interested, you can study on this. But uh, let me give you a quotation from um, an encyclopedia. Fortuna, F-O-R-T-U-N-A. Fortuna was the goddess of fortune and the personification of luck in Roman religion. Fortuna is often depicted with a ship's rudder, a wheel of fortune, and a horn of plenty. She might bring good or bad luck. She represents the fact that life is capricious. She has also been called the goddess of fate. End of quote. So every time someone buys a lottery ticket, rolls the dice, spins the wheel, or plays a card and backs it with money, it is a sacrifice to the goddess Fortuna with the expectation of a blessing. So it's idolatry. So we shouldn't take gambling lightly. We should look at gambling as an invasion of genuine spirituality. Uh, gambling has been prominent all through history. As a matter of fact, I spent the summer reading about some of our founding fathers, and many of them had no problem with gambling at all. There were a number of them that would fit into the category of evangelical Christians today that would not gamble. Uh, most, Many of them would not even go to the taverns and uh, drink beer. But don't take gambling lightly. Most people do. Just as a lot of Christians celebrate Halloween, as we saw this morning in the DVD we watched, a lot of Christians find no problem with going out and buying a lotto ticket, buying a scratch-off, or even getting involved in an office pool. A lot of people do that. One of the biggest problems I got into in, in uh, working in a factory down in Dallas, Texas, with that seminary, because I wouldn't get into a pool over who was whether Dallas Cowboys were going to win, uh, you know, the uh, NFL championship or not. So gambling violates a lot of Bible principles. There's a lot more that can be said about gambling, but let me just quickly review. Gambling involves lying to people. Number one. Number two. Gambling involves not being industrious. And number three, gambling involves investing unwisely. And number four, gambling involves disrespecting other people, not showing them love, exploiting them for the benefit of the casino. And then number five, gambling is actually committing idolatry. And God says, thou shalt have no other gods before me.
Let's stand together for prayer. God spoke into your heart. The altar is open. Lord, lay some soul upon my heart, and Paul, lead us in prayer. Please, sir. Thank you. 